Thanks for tuning in online to Community Church. As a church, we are focused on sharing the love and hope of Jesus with everyone we meet. We hope you enjoy today's message. All in, how are you guys feeling this beautiful Sunday morning? You know, it's just sometimes I feel it and sometimes I don't. Hey, listen, I've, uh, I've got a lot of exciting things happening today. Number one, uh, the 21 day fast ends today. And uh, if you've been fasting with us, I'll just be honest, this has been, for, for me personally and for many that I've talked to, the, uh, the best fast uh, we've ever had in really drawing closer to God. And at the same time, it's always a celebration when you know you get to eat the food you like. Uh, at the end of the day, in fact, last time I checked, sundown was 520, so I'm pretty excited about that coming uh, later on tonight. But um, I wanted to just share something, a couple things real cool at the start here this weekend. Uh, first, if you're not aware, we have a, a campus that meets at Rivers Correctional Facility uh, in partnership with God Behind Bars. And yesterday at our campus there, over 20 men went all in for Jesus. Come on. That is why we do what we do to see people come alive in Christ. And uh, so very exciting, all that God is doing. I uh, also want to make sure you're aware, in case you missed it, we are launching a Community Church Suffolk campus March 26th. Community Church Suffolk is coming March 26th. And this Tuesday night, uh, if you weren't able to be at the meetings this past weekend, uh, but you want to be a part of what God is doing Tuesday night, Western Branch Campus uh, Main Auditorium, be here and uh, get connected and uh, see all that God would have for you there. Uh, next weekend also, I want to let you know we've got my good friend, Pastor Mike Plain in the house. He'll be preaching. He last uh, was here with us during the release and uh, just a, uh, a spiritual father, a man of wisdom to come and pour into us. Be a great, great weekend uh, to bring a friend and see what God would do. Today, we get to finish our All In Message series. And uh, if you were here last weekend, what I said to you was, we, um, we lost a weekend because of the snow, so we're taking four weeks of a message series and putting it into three weeks of a message series. So I've got a lot of good stuff for you today, so I need you to stay with me. I'm also praying my voice is going to hold out. So we're going to hope, and if I spit a cough drop to the front row, I'm sorry. <laughs> I love you. I want to start by asking this question. How many of you here know somebody, because I'm sure this isn't you, how many of you here know somebody that when something bad happens in your life, it, whatever it is, immediately everything that is happening in your life is bad? Like you get bad news about one thing and the sky is falling. I mean, we've started the year, we're just three weeks into 2017, couple things maybe haven't gone right, and your whole outlook on this year has begun to shift from positive to negative. Now, that's not anybody watching online, that's not anybody at our campus today, but we all know some people like that, don't we? We all know some people who, who they, they get bad news, and all of a sudden they're like, this always happens, it's just going to be so bad. It's never going to turn around. And you're like, man, this is just depressing. All that happened was we were late to one meeting. <laughs> why, why does this mean our whole year is ruined? And yet, that mindset shift to negative ends up causing us to walk in that negative reality. I'm going to talk this weekend about what it means to have an all-in mindset about how our life could and should be lived with an all-in mindset. With this statement, if you're taking notes, my mindset determines my movement. My mindset determines my movement. The things I do with my life, the things that you do with your life, they are a result of your mindset. They're a result of your expectation. They're a result of your thinking patterns. They're a result of, do you think this is going to be successful? Do you think this is going to fail? And how you feel about either of those things. My mindset determines my movements. <clears throat> I've recently been reading a book called Mindset, and, and the author talks about kind of the reality of how we look at life, the reality of, of kind of failures and successes. And, and she did this study to discover why people have a certain outlook on life, and, and she did it starting with kids at a young age. 
to look at the difference of failures and successes. And let's just get right out to start here. How many of you have here just to be asked the simple question, do you want to succeed in the things you do in life? You'd say yes. Just lift your hand up. Be honest in church. I mean, like, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm not like, where's the failure section? That's where I want to go. <laughs> I feel like it's common sense. Well, you this study to find out, like, how kids would react by giving them something challenging. And she found out she would give some, some kids what she did was she gave them this super difficult, complicated puzzle. How many of you like puzzles? I don't really care for you people. <laughs> my wife, Megan, she loves puzzles. And uh, my goal every year, not really my goal every year, but I try to do a puzzle with her because I know she likes it. And we had one out on the dining room table um, pretty much all the holidays. And we didn't complete it, but that's why 2017 is my year, because we're going to complete. <laughs> so she gave these kids these puzzles, and she watched something. She watched how some kids wouldn't even try, because they thought they would fail. And therefore, they didn't want to attempt. And other kids would say, this is awesome. I love a good challenge. Another kid, I'll try to give you exactly what she said. Uh, another, kid, um, another kid failed at the puzzle and said, you know, I was hoping that this would be informative. <laughs> <clears throat> to which the author thought, what's wrong with them? <laughs> it led her to discover how people respond to challenges and failures depends not on whether or not they are going to fail, but what their mindset is before they start. One of the things that we're talking about in this series and I want us to catch today is that in an all-in mindset, you will live out our core values as a church. Values determine culture. Our values determine what they do. They determine our mindset. And the one I want to start with here this weekend is this, growing means changing. When you grow in life, it sometimes feels like you're failing, which is why so many people never actually grow. We never actually, if you will, get better, because to get better, you have to get weaker. To get better, you have to go down. To get better, and you know, this is in strength training, this is in getting, I mean, uh, students, I hope that you're loving school. Your, your parents probably didn't love school, but yet we want students to love school today. Why do we not always love school? Because in order to get smarter, there's sometimes a struggle. And the goal of school is not to just get through it. The goal is to actually learn. And how many of you know to learn, you gotta sometimes feel like you're failing you got to actually step in and let yourself change. The author of this book found this. People have one of two mindsets, fixed or growth. A fixed mindset in life says this, I don't think I can succeed, so I just won't do it. And I read that, I'm like, oh my gosh. That explains so many people. A growth mindset is those Kids that none of us understand at age 10 that go, I was hoping this would be informative. I'm so glad I failed at this puzzle because now all the, engineer, all the engineers listening to me right now are like, that's right. I love it when I can figure something out, right? It's this growth mindset. But understand, when we step into the Bible, when we step into God's word, into the life of faith that is intended for the follower of Jesus Christ, it explains everything. It explains that the people who fulfill God's plan for their life are people with a growth mindset because anything God wants you to do, in fact, the Bible says to please God requires this one thing. It's called faith. And faith means I will do something. I will use my life in a way that I don't know if I will succeed until I step out and try. I just trust that God's gonna use me. I just trust that even if the world says I failed, he will use it to actually help other people in the days ahead. It's what caused this guy David, if you've never heard the story of David and Goliath, I wanna talk about it this weekend. And I know that it's a, it's a popular story even if you're new to church. It's the story of this young boy, his name was David, he became king, God called him to be the leader of, of his people of the nation as he would go against this, this giant called Goliath over nine feet tall. 
And, and I love what one person said. A growth mindset is what caused David to see a giant that couldn't be missed because he was so big when everybody else saw a giant that couldn't be beaten because he was so big. Just take a moment, do an inventory of a couple problems in your life. The ones that seem the biggest should be the easiest. Can't miss these. <laughs> I got this one. Which if we really think about it, it's the small things in life that tend to trip us up. Let's learn David and Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. I'm just going to jump through some of this, mainly because I don't think my voice will hold up to read the whole thing, but also so you're not here through the 1030 service. It says the Philistines mustered their army for battle and camped between Asaku and Judah and Azekah at Ephes Damim. How many of you like Bible words from the Old Testament? Come on. <laughs> In Israel, we go to half these places. It's so awesome. And Israelis that pronounce them perfectly are there. It's so good. <laughs> Saul was the leader of the Israeli army. The Philistine army wanted to come against them. They're standing on either side. These armies would come together on either side of this place called the Valley of Allah, where we'll also be in Israel in November. Just all these side plug-ins because I want you to go to Israel. It'll change your life. And they'd come out there and just look at each other. Kind of like if you're an ultimate fighting fan, they just stare at each other. That's what these armies would do. Over this valley, they would just come and they would stare at each other. But Goliath would be kind of the guy that would walk out front. It says this in verse 8. Goliath stood and he shouted a taunt to all the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He said. I'm the Philistine champion. You're only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. This is God's army, if you will, against the people who are against God's people. And it says they came out against God's people and they go, come on. And it says they were scared and they were fearful. Do you know what we sometimes do when we're scared and fearful? This. We freeze. That's what that is. It's freezing. <laughs> it's making... Paralyzed with fear. We wouldn't say that in our life today. You wouldn't say, you know, I'm just paralyzed with fear. What you would say is, I don't know what to do. So I just don't do anything. I don't know what to do about this problem at school. I don't know what to do about this problem in my marriage. I don't know what to do about this problem with my kids. I don't know what to do about this problem at work. Go on down the list and we would say, I don't know what to do. And so what happens is fear steps in and I literally just, I don't do anything. I just stand there. And in the face of an issue or a problem, standing frozen will never make it better. But understand something that's very important if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Something that separates this Old Testament example from a reality of living today after Jesus has come to the earth, died on the cross, and ascended back to heaven and given you and I something. He's given us his spirit. And the Bible declares this in 2 Timothy. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Which means there's never an enemy that can attack me that gives me the power, that, that has the power to make me freeze in fear. Amen. Instead, when I see something and I don't know what to do, if fear is what's rising up inside of me, I've got to remember to squash it back down because the spirit of God inside of me trumps fear every time. Amen. I have to remember that. David knew that. They were scared. We're going to learn in a minute that David wasn't. Here's why if you're a note taker. What I see is a reflection of what I think. They were scared because they did not think they could defeat the army. They were scared because they saw failure. You know when I'm the most confident in my life is when I can see success. And I'm using these words just to be in practical terms, okay? 
when I can see the victory, when I can see how things are, that's when I'm like, yes, I know this is gonna work out. I can see it. But how many of you know sometimes you can see something, but then what starts to happen right before you, it's like, well, this isn't how I thought this should go. Let's continue our story, verse 22. It says, David, he left his things. He he left the the sheep he was taking care of. He was a shepherd uh, taking care of his dad's sheep, and his dad was sending him out uh, to the army and and Saul's army because some of his brothers were there. So his dad was sending him out. It says, David left his things with the keeper of the supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. He was talking with, and, and as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. And as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. I was reading this this week, and this jumped like, like blew my mind, so go here with me. This is right, this is how we're doing this today. <laughs> Mainly, yeah, here we go. <clears throat> David heard something. Everyone else saw something. What they saw caused them to run away in fright. David already saw victory. In everything that he knew about his God, victory was what would happen. He had spent his entire life, like in the Bible, if you read the whole story, killing the animals that would try to come and, and attack the sheep. He had seen how God had delivered him countless times. So it didn't actually matter what naturally was right before David. He always saw victory. So he merely heard this Philistine giant yell, He may have saw him in the natural, but he did not see what everybody else saw. You know what happened to David? He didn't allow what he heard to change what he saw. He didn't allow hearing a giant yell, hey, I'm going to kill you, change what he saw. My life, your life, if you're here and a follower of Jesus, there's a pretty good chance that you have some hopes and dreams for your future. There's a pretty good chance that you feel, even if you don't know exactly what your future looks like, that you believe God has something good for you. And there's also a pretty good chance that there will be people in your life that will begin to say things that you will hear that will try to get you to see something different than what you believe God has promised you. They will try to, even sometimes people who are, you think, closest to you will say things into your hearing to try to get you to see something different than what you know God has said to you. This is literally what David was fighting in this moment. And I want to tell you a rule I live by, and you might want to also. I will not let what I hear change what I see. I will not let a lie of the enemy, no matter where it comes, whether it's just something that I sense or if it's something that comes from another person, change what I see in what God has promised. David did this. He always saw victory. And in verse 41, it says this, Goliath walked out toward David. I just love this because it says, Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him. He's a giant, nine feet tall, yet he still had a shield bearer. (laughs) wimp, sneering (laughs) in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come to me with a stick? He cursed David by the names of his gods. He said, come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. David replied, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. Sorry, it's just what the Bible says. (laughs) Then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know there's a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. This is a boy. Students, this is your people. 
Maybe you're listening to me today, you're a teenager, and you're like, I don't know if I can be used by God yet. You better believe it. This is a young boy who's going to defy all the enemies of God's people by declaring, it's not that I'm amazing, though with God working through me, nothing can defeat me. Everybody else was scared. Every adult with tons of armor was scared. Yet one boy goes, hey, I don't see what you people see. I see a God who gives victory. I see a God who gives victory to everything that comes before me. See, David, David lived out one of our values here. Proclaim and become good news. He proclaimed. He declared, guess what? God is going to take care of this problem. Sometimes proclaiming good news, it means you have to declare it before you can actually see it in the natural. He said, hey, let's make it modern today. Jesus is going to turn this around in your life. God is going to cause restoration. Proclaiming the goodness of God and the things that he does in our life. But then we don't just stop at saying it. We also do what we need to do to cause it to be a reality. That's what David did. He said, hey, God's going to do this. But he did what he could do. It says this in verse 48. Goliath moved closer to attack. David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling, and he hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled, and he fell face down on the ground. In this instance, becoming good news meant getting rid of the enemy. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. One of the things I love about the Bible is picking new things out of a story I've read many times. David had no sword. Maybe you're like me here today, and sometimes you've had this thought. Well, I could do that too if I had what they had. Well, of course I would be able to be like that if I had the same thing that they have. I could be as good of a preacher, I could be as good of a husband, I could have this, I could have this, if I only had what they had. The whole army had the swords. David did it. But an all-in mindset always lives out this value. You do everything with excellence. What does it mean to do everything with excellence? It means I do the best with what I have. So often we look at what we have and we have this thought, it's not good enough to achieve so we don't do anything. I hope that you'll hear me on this statement. God won't put you in a position where he won't equip you for the victory. He won't put you in a relationship. He won't put you in a job. He won't put you in a future. Well, he will not equip you for the victory. If he doesn't give you a sword, it's because you don't need one. Use what you have. Use what you have. Shake what the good Lord gave you. I don't know. Just anyway. <laughs> I, think that, I think that we can overcomplicate this idea of, of living all in. I think that we can make it, make it into something it's not intended to be. When I talk about in the, in, in all in for me, it's, it's to be as real as I could. It's, it's like my anthem. Because I grew up in church but it was only when I decided to go all in for Jesus. And what that means is I'm going I'm to trust him. I'm going, I'm going first. I'm believing that he's got me and I'm not going to turn away. Because I, I was like in church and then not in church and then in church and then not in church. In fact, probably the story of many of you listening today. And when it would be like, I want to get this thing right with God. And then I would go away for a period of time and, and you know, have fun. Because in case you've ever wondered, sin is fun. That's the only reason people are tempted to do it. So just understand that. Like, but then it always leaves you wanting more. So then I'd come back. I'm like, I know God's the answer. It wasn't until I made a shift inside 
to go, no, this is it, this is my focus, this is my dedication, it's Jesus, that I begin to realize the life that he would really have for me. And what happened inside of me, I believe it's what David knew back then, is it's following God isn't complicated. It's not easy, but it's not complicated. It's very simple. In fact, in the New Testament, some people came to Jesus and they were like, we want to understand this whole life of following you, the all-in life, if you will. What is it we're supposed to do if we really want to live for you? What does an all-in mindset really look like? That we could be like David and see what God sees, always victory. That when we hear lies of the enemy, when we hear lives even of, of sometimes people who, who we thought we could trust trying to get us off course, we, we don't fall into that trap. We stay focused. Jesus said, here's what you need to know. The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. How do you live an all-in life? You love God and you love people. You love God and you love people. You love God and you love people. It's part of the heartbeat of our church. It's getting rid of, of, of just the, I'll, I'm trying to find an adjective that's appropriate from the pulpit, but none are popping into my head right now. <laughs> you get rid of the stuff that just causes people to, to have a bad idea about what it means to be a Christian. The stuff that divides churches, it's always when we, we make up rules and regulations that were never in the scriptures to begin with. Jesus said, you've got to go after this loving God and loving people. I said this last night, and I hope you'll hear my heart. This is not a political statement. I'm watching what goes on in our nation, and it's simply this. One side rages, another side rages. One side rages, another side rages. It doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum you look at. It's just a bunch of people that are raging. And I'm, I'm feeling like, wow, if we would really, really love God and love people, really do this. The first time we were named in Outreach Magazine, Fastest Growing Churches, a couple years ago, they, they asked me in an interview, what is it you think that has caused Community Church to begin to grow so rapidly? And I said, I think it's this. We say that we have a value to love God and love people, and we really mean it. It's not that we just say it, like we really mean it. And we mean it because this moment, this hour of human history that you and I live in, it's too important to just let it pass. It's too important in 2017 to just go through the motions and see what happens. Hampton Roads, there's over a million people that do not know God loves them. Our campus in Manila, literally millions of people that don't know God loves them. And he looks at you and I, and he goes, will you live out your life with an all-in mindset? Would you be intentional? Matthew chapter nine, Jesus said something, and so true for us. He had traveled through the towns and villages, teaching and announcing the good news, the Bible says. He healed every disease and illness. He saw the crowds, it says in verse 36. And he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. When I look at our nation and the nations around the world, this is what I feel like I see happen all the time. We're just, we just, get, we're just confused. Everybody has some good ideas, everybody has some bad ideas. <laughs> We're just confused. Jesus saw that this is what's happening. They want to do what's right. They're confused. They're helpless. They don't know what to do. They're like sheep without a shepherd. So he looked, Jesus said, it said in verse 37, he looked at his disciples, guys that were hanging out with him, and he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. And he said, guys, there's people everywhere. This is just a small sampling. But the people that are carriers of our love, we need more of them. So he goes, pray. 
pray that God would raise up more workers. We pray as a church that God would raise up more people. In fact, the moment you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you become a worker in the harvest. And let me tell you the picture I, I kind of saw as I was prepping for this message. Jesus makes a, a declaration. The harvest is plentiful. There are so many people that are ripe to experience the love of God. And I thought about picking strawberries. How many of you pick strawberries? Love me some good strawberries. We eat them till our mouth hurts. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, I don't know why I did that. And then you do it again the next year, and this is great. But when you go to the strawberry patch, you'll find there are strawberries that got ripe and they never got harvested when they should have. So now they are rotten. Jesus has a call on my life. He has a call on your life, Community Church, to go into our neighborhoods, to go into our schools, to go into our places of work and connect with these people today that are ripe. They're ready. There's no greater mission you or I will ever be able to give our life to than reaching people with the love of Jesus and helping them live fully alive. So I give you this last value to understand why we do what we do as a church. It's this, every number has a name and every name matters to God. Every single number. It's a person, there's a history, there's a story, there's a future. Maybe, maybe you're here today and you're here because you're, you're here to learn. You're not simply a number or a face in the crowd. You're at church this Sunday morning. You're watching online right now on this Sunday morning to realize maybe for the first time you matter to God. His purpose for your life is so good. It's, it, it's not about numbers, but it is. Because numbers are people, and people matter to God. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes people say negative things. Did you know that? I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Sometimes people say negative things about <clears throat> large churches. And they say, oh, you know, they, they only care about numbers. That's, that's all they're about, is getting more people. And uh, I'm like, that's what Jesus was about. Jesus was about reaching more people. Do you know how you grow in your faith the most? Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and you're listening at this 9 a.m. service. You know how you grow in your faith the most? By using your life to reach other people who are not followers of Jesus. That's how you grow in your faith the most. You should read your Bible and you should pray. But if all you do is read your Bible and come to church and pray and you don't actually share your faith, you don't actually bring unchurched people with you to church, you will never reach the potential of your Christian maturity. So I, I, I want to live with an all-in mindset. And I want you, Community Church, to live with an all-in mindset. And I want to make sure that if you're here today listening to me or you're watching online, and you're one of the people who, who maybe before today you would have just been living as if you're a number, not knowing how much God mattered, how much you mattered to God, that you change that today. That you know you give your life to living for him all in no longer halfway, but with your everything. So would you close your eyes with me? And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just lead us in a prayer as we close this morning. 
I'm going to ask that if you pray this prayer with me for the first time or first time in a long time that you do tell somebody. But I'm not going to ask you necessarily to respond physically right now. I do want you to be honest. I shared a couple of minutes ago that, that I was in church on an awful lot before I actually decided to go all in. Maybe that's your story today. Maybe your story today is you're back in church for the first time in a long time. But either way, maybe you know today's a day I need to make a decision to go all in. I'm gonna ask you to really to just obey what God's doing in your heart and saying, yeah, I'm gonna go all in for you. If you're already all in, then this is just an opportunity to pray this prayer with me again today of just a, a declaration of what you believe and how you live your life. We pray together. It's one of the beauties of being a church family. But let's pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving me a future. Thank you for forgiving me. Today, I've decided I'm living for you. It's not about me. It's about you. But I know as I live for you, my best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching the service today. If you began or renewed your relationship with Jesus today, or you need prayer for something going on in your life, please let us know. If you're watching on a computer, you can do that by clicking on one of the buttons below. Or if you're watching us on the Community Church app, you can select Contact Us under the About Us tab. We'd love to know your story and how Jesus is using Community Church to impact your life. Thanks again for hanging out with us, and we hope you'll keep watching and taking next steps in your relationship with Jesus.